Moving on after this week uh, to the next verse, verse 10. So this morning, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 9, recite it with me. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. As we're considering Psalm chapter 70, what I'd like to do before we get there is I would like to remind us of some amazing truths that we find in this very chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 8, uh, that are going to sort of steer and guide us as we think about uh, Psalm chapter 70. Uh, So this morning we're going to just review a couple of truths that, that I want to lay down as a foundation before we get into Psalm 70. And, and the first one is found in Romans 8, 28 and 29. It says this, and we know. So we know something. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. So, We know something, and what we know is that for those who love God, everything, all things work together for good. Okay? And those who love God are those who are called according to His purpose. In verse 29, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So the first thing that I want us to think about or or put as a foundation as we consider Psalm chapter 70 is this, that for those that love God, that is, those who are called according to his purpose, those who he foreknew, everything works together for good. There is not one thing in your life that God is not using to work together for your good. And that good is that you would be conformed more and more to the image of Christ. That you would look more and more like Christ. So your life is like a block of marble and God is Michelangelo and he is chipping away at that marble I think it was Michelangelo that did David, right? Chipping away at that marble and making this, this resemblance of Christ in your life. So foundational truth number one from Romans chapter 8 is that God is always working for your good if you are called according to his purpose, if you love God, and that good that he is working toward is that you would be conformed, changed, transformed to look more and more like Christ in your life. Second foundational truth from Romans chapter 8 comes from verses 17 and 18. It says this, verse 16 says, the Spirit bears witness that we're children, and verse 17 says, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided that we suffer with him in order that we might be glorified with him. So the fact that we are children of God means that we have a glorious inheritance to look forward to. Everything, we've talked about this in Romans, the whole world will be ours. Everything of God's will be ours. We will be fellow heirs with Christ as inheritors of everything that the Father has provided that you suffer with Him in order that you might be glorified with Him. So your suffering then, this temporary experience of suffering in this life, is working and moving toward a greater purpose, namely that you would be glorified with Christ one day. And then he said, leads him to say in verse 18, For I consider the sufferings of this present life not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. So foundational truth number two is that we will be glorified with Him provided we suffer with Him and our suffering with Him is preparing us for glory in such a way that we can honestly say, I don't think Paul is being hyperbolic here. I don't think he's just exaggerating to make a point. I honestly think that Paul could say, I really don't consider the sufferings of this present world worth comparing to anything 
especially the glory that's going to be revealed to us. The reason I know that is because in Philippians, he says, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I live, uh, if I'm living, that means faithful ministry to me. And by the way, he's writing this in a prison, right? He's, he's, not, he's not on a yacht somewhere. He's not hanging out in some rich guy's house eating fancy food. He's, he's in a prison chain to, chain to a, a guard, like not a good situation to be saying this. So he's saying, like, for me to live as Christ in the worst possible situation and to die as gain because I get Christ. So foundational truth number three or two is that we can consider the sufferings of this present life not worth comparing with the glory because the suffering is preparing us for glory. And then he sort of sums all this up in in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 39. And he says things like, what can separate us from the love of God? Can tribulation or distress or persecution or nakedness or famine or sword, those are all like, that's suffering language, that's difficulty language, that's, that's not this primrose path of ease. It's, it's difficult, it's hard, it's laborious, it's dangerous. Can that separate us from the love of Christ? No. Who can bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he says, that is, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded like sheep to be slaughtered. In verse 37 of Romans chapter 8, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In these things, in the tribulation, in the distress, in the famine, in the persecution, in the nakedness, in the sword, all of those things, in those things, we are more than conquerors through Christ. So I wanted to to lay some foundation here in Romans chapter 8, because it's going to be a while before we get to Romans chapter 8. And uh, the, the reason I wanted to do that is because I want to undergird this idea. That, like, notice that Paul never says that you're not going to suffer. But he does promise that in your suffering, there will be victory, there will be perseverance, there will be hope. Because what you're experiencing is working towards something. It's teaching us. It's making us like Christ through our suffering. And as a result, we suffer differently than the rest of the world does. So uh, this last summer, I coached baseball. And uh, my coaching philosophy for baseball is, is insanely simple. It's do the small things well. It's, it's taking and learning elementary baseball principles and doing them repeatedly over and over and over again until you do them so well that they're natural, that they're second hand. And so a lot of the, the stuff that I was working through with the, the young men seemed very tedious. Like, when do we get to do the cool stuff? When do we get to, get to learn to flip the ball behind our back like the pros do? When do we get to learn to, you know, do the glove flip or, or throw a knuckleball or, you know, whatever? Here's the thing. Those professional baseball players didn't get to that level without learning the basics and going over the basics over and over and over and over again. In other words, there's no glory without training. Paul tells Timothy, train yourself for godliness, right? Bodily training is of some value, but spiritual training has eternal value. And part of being united to Christ, part of us trusting in Jesus Christ and his life being united to us and our life being united to his is that we would begin to look more like he does, that we would be shaped and molded more and more to look like Jesus Christ. That's why God can say things like, be holy as I am holy. There's practical holiness without which you will not see the Lord. That's in Hebrews. So to become like Christ, we must embrace suffering and the sanctifying work that God is doing through suffering. And when we look at Psalm chapter 70, we see a person that is suffering. 
And, and when we live our lives with Christ at the center of everything, when, when he is the sun and the orbit of our lives is centered around him such that the, our, our lives just literally revolve around him, you should expect to face some opposition. You should expect to suffer. When we treasure Christ above all else, we should expect to suffer, which is why Christ says things like, like he says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things that you may have peace. That's what we all want, right? We all want peace. Who Christ has told us things so that we might have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. You will have difficulty. You will have suffering. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That's why Christ says stuff like that. He says stuff like that because when, when we live a life of a disciple of Christ, when we live a life of a follower of Christ, and I'm not talking about the followers like the fake ones, that we see in, in the Gospel of John. I'm talking like a, like, a, like a radically sold out for Christ. We'll do anything he asks. My world of my life revolves and orbits around the all-satisfying Son of God type of thing. Like, that's what I'm talking about here. When, when that happens, we're going to have trouble. But Christ has overcome the world. He's graded. That's, what, that's why he says things like in John 12, 32, Fear not, little flock. I love it. This is one of my favorite passages. One of my favorite things that Christ ever said. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This kingdom is not of this world. So when we, when we face difficulties, we can, we can strengthen ourselves with this. Um, I'm going to be relying on some help from C.S. Lewis um, in this sermon. So C.S. Lewis wrote a book. I, I would really recommend it to you. It's called uh, uh, A Grief Observed. There it is. A Grief Observed. Now, this is particularly providential because one year ago this weekend, Carly's mom passed away. And we were in a used bookstore, and Carly is normally very against going into used bookstores with me because that is a dangerous proposition. If you've been to my office, you know, I will get books and, and work through them, and there's better things sometimes to spend our money on. And so we were in this used bookstore, and I found A Grief Observed. There were actually two copies, and I got a copy for us, and we sent a copy to her dad. And I've never read it, but I've, I've read enough of Lewis to know that he probably had some really good insights. This is one thing that, that Lewis says in A Grief Observed. I'm going to be quoting various text from there as we go through this. We were promised suffering. They were part of the program. We're even told, blessed are those who mourn. And I accept it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Of course, it's different when this thing happens to oneself, not to others, and in reality and not imagination. Because we say, I had an intellectual understanding of the fact that, that suffering is part and parcel with the whole following Christ gig. But it's one thing to see it. It's one thing to know it. And it's another thing to experience it. So we're not promised in Scripture that we won't suffer. In fact, the word promises the opposite. And why shouldn't we? Christian life is a, is a life of dying to oneself, living for Christ. And when we live for Christ in a world that hates Christ, we should expect suffering. We should expect slander and mockery. And, and, you know, it's really interesting to me, like the radical things that we see in Scripture as you read through like the book of Acts, for example, or you read through the Pauline epistles and you hear about these crazy things that happened to Paul. The radical things that happen to believers in the Bible are radically ordinary. They're radically ordinary. They're not like, they're not some crazy thing that, we, it might be crazy to us, but maybe the problem is the fact that we're not really following Christ like we should. Maybe the reason this thing seems so radical for us is because our worlds don't revolve around the center of the universe, Christ. And we've turned our lives to revolve around what we perceive to be the center of the universe, namely ourselves. 
or something else. You see, when I look at Scripture and when I see these lives of these believers, they're just ordinary. And to us, we call it radical. To us, we call it extraordinary. There's a, there's a, a radically ordinary flavor about the life of a Christ follower. The life of a person that's willing to give up anything for Christ. The life of a person that seeks to find their joy and satisfaction in Christ alone. The life of somebody that is willing to say, you tell me where you want me to go and I'll go there. You tell me what you want me to do and I'll go there without reservation. Right? We're talking about that type of radical, ordinary Christian life that doesn't hold things back. It doesn't sit there and say, okay, you can have this portion of my life, but I'm holding on to this one. I, I like this the way it is. I'm comfortable here. And, and I think what's happened is we've, we've bowed our knees to the God of comfort. We've bowed our knees to the life of ease. We've bought the American dream that says that you should be comfortable, you should be wealthy, you should be able to buy all the gadgets that you want, you should be able to order and structure your life around what you want, what makes you happy, and what pr provides this persona of success to everybody else. And that's not Christian. The radical, ordinary life of a Christian is one of complete and total surrender to Christ in every aspect of their life. Total willingness for him to say whatever he wants with whatever part of our lives he wants to say it with and us to say, yes. I don't like it, maybe. It makes me uncomfortable, yes. But you can have it because I'm trusting everything to you. These things are normal. And when those things happen, we're going to be mocked. We're going to be slandered. Not only that, but we live in a fallen world that's been damaged by sin, and so we experience suffering in the form of loss and pain and sickness. So how should we respond to this? Well, often, the way that we respond is we're, like, taken back. Very surprised. How could this happen to me? I, I, I get it, like maybe somebody else, but they're kind of an idiot, they deserve it. I've done all the right stuff. I've played the game the right way. I've stayed away from all the stuff I'm supposed to stay away from. I've gone to all the stuff I'm supposed to go to. How is, how is this happening to me? We, we get surprised. And at the very least, the fact that people die should take away any sort of surprise and suffering. Like, if you get married, when you get married, you don't think that your spouse is going to die. Right? When you, when you get married at a young age, you're all Twitter pated, and you know, you're thinking about all the things that you have. It's a Bambi reference, by the way. All the things that you have, all the things that you're going to do, all the dreams, aspirations. Design. No one ever considers the fact, like, what, what, if, what if one of us doesn't make it as long as the other? Or what do I do when I've walked through life with this person for 40, 50 years and they die? We, we blind ourselves to suffering. We blind ourselves to these things that we really do face in life. So how should we respond to suffering? We often get angry. We get bitter because we're addicted to comfort and not treasuring Christ like we should. So 1 Peter 4.12 says this, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as though some strange thing were happening to you. Don't let it catch you off guard. Don't, don't be surprised about it as if something strange were happening. Tim Keller said this, everyone experience suffering, experiences suffering. Suffering makes someone either bitter or better. So as we're going through this, I want you to ask yourself, what, is, what does suffering do in my life? Is it making me bitter? Or is it making me better? Let's look at Psalm 70. Psalm 70 starts this way. Make haste, O God, deliver me. Make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them, who turn, let them turn back because of their shame who say, Aha, aha. 
May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Psalmist is experiencing suffering. We see some things in the psalm that relate to suffering. So there's three parts to this sermon. One is reactions to suffering. Second is the purpose of suffering. And third is the response to suffering. So number one, reactions to suffering. What are the reactions that we see in this text? First, we see fear. Hasten, O God, or make haste to me, O God, to deliver deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me, save me, help me. I'm terrified. When we suffer, especially when we suffer greatly, we tend to fear, do we not? C.S. Lewis in, in the book of Grief Observed said this, No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. We fear that God has abandoned us. We fear that we might not make it through the suffering. We fear the pain and sorrow that we will experience in the midst of that suffering. And the question we have to ask ourselves, is there anyone who can understand this? Is there anyone that I can turn to that will truly understand what this is like? And the answer is yes. There is. His name is Christ. And he is a high priest who has been tested in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore, with confidence, draw near to the throne. Christ understands. And one of the benefits of being united with Christ by faith, and one of the uh, reasons that the doctrine of Christ being fully God and fully man in one person, called the hypostatic union, is so precious, is because in his humanity, he understands us. He understands us in a way because he has experienced what we are going through. So there are people that say, our doctrine is stupid. Doctrine matters because without the doctrine of Christ being fully God and being fully man, we might not have somebody that can actually sympathize with us, that understands what we are going through and that has gone through the very things that we go through on a daily basis, but perfectly on our behalf. Christ not only stands, but he walks through the suffering with us. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So, first part is talking about love of money. Second part, being content with what we have. Okay, that's, that's applicable to all sorts of different situations. We should be content what we have even in the midst of suffering. And the reason for that, the basis for that is because Christ said, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you. So what do we do with that? Therefore, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Now, is that not an encouragement when you're walking in the midst of suffering? You've got a promise That Christ says, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will be with you. The same type of thing with Israel. When you walk through the fire, I will be there with you. And therefore, we can respond in worship and praise and adoration and say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Or Matthew 28, verse 20, And behold, I am with you always. I am with you always. I am with you always, 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 always. Always. Even until the end of the age. Which means that what you're experiencing in this temporal time space, Christ is walking through it with you. Because he's with you always until the end of the age, until the end of time. We're very familiar with this. We often try to make Psalm 23 about us. Psalm 23, 4. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What kills fear in this text? You are with me. You're here. You're leading me. You're guiding me. You're my shepherd. You're protecting me. You're you're walking me through this valley that's filled with fear and anguish. And you're there with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your discipline and your encouragement comfort me. So we respond a lot of times with fear, and the antidote to that is Christ, because he is with us. Or the second thing that we see here is that this person feels threatened. Verse 2, let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Now, when we walk through life with Christ at the center, when we walk through life treasuring Christ above all else in our lives, there will be those that will seek our hurt. When we live for His glory, when we live this radically ordinary way that we're called to live in the Bible, there will be those who threaten us. They will seek our hurt. They will seek, even maybe take our lives. It can take the form of many different forms. It can take the form of somebody threatening to try to ruin you. All the stuff that you've worked for, all the things that you've tried to accomplish, and they just try to undergird that and undercut that and ruin you. Try to untangle everything in your life. They seek to undermine your faith, seeking to see you not succeed as a follower of Christ. Let's be real honest. The most common way that this shows up is slander and gossip. That's how people seek to undermine believers. Slander and gossip. You are of your father the devil. He was a liar from the beginning and there is no truth in him. When we follow Christ in this radically ordinary way where he is everything to us and our lives revolve around him, there will be those that seek to harm us, that threaten us, that seek to undermine us, that gossip, that slander, that lie, that cheat, that try to make our lives uh, unravel around us in such a way that we deny Christ, we deny the faith. Did Christ experience that? How often was Christ threatened? How often did people seek to kill him and harm him and hurt him? And ultimately they succeeded. He was killed. He was murdered. Do you think that Christ can understand when you're being threatened as you walk this path of obedience, as you walk this path of being a radically ordinary Christ follower? Third thing we see is mockery. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. There are those that are watching your life and the minute that things don't go your way, they are standing right there ready to make fun of you, ready to mock you, ready to ridicule you. You're old-fashioned. You're just believing in fairy tales. They'll laugh at you for praying or prioritizing your life around Christ, for not participating in things that they want you to participate in. Christ experienced mockery. Let me ask you a different way. Did he experience mockery in the midst of the greatest suffering that anyone will ever experience in this world? He had a crown of thorns put on him. He had a robe placed around him after he'd been beaten and whipped And the soldiers came by and spit in his face and kneeled down in front of him and mocked him. And then they nailed him to the tree. And the people all around him mocked him even more as he's laying there suffocating with nails piercing through his body. He understands what it is to be mocked. But Hebrews says... Let's look to Christ. 
the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So he understands not only what it is to walk through suffering with people mocking, but he understands the victory that comes on the other side of that. He's experienced everything that we've experienced yet without sin. So here's the point. When we experience the suffering, not if, when we experience suffering, Christ is not calling us to experience anything that he has not experienced himself and has not perfectly experienced on our behalf without sin. And that makes him uniquely qualified to minister to us in the midst of our suffering. So he makes him uniquely qualified to meet our needs in the midst of suffering. Even when no one else understands, he does. So through faith in Christ, you have a friend who has been tested and tried in every way that you are, who's experienced suffering just like you, yet without sin, who's seated at the right hand of the Father and is interceding for you, is your advocate who is on your side. And not only that, he doesn't just do that in this lofty way where he's just up there and you're down here and he says, well, figure it out, puny little human. His humanity is still part of who he is now. And he does not leave us to experience this on our own, but walks through this with us as our comforter, as our hope, as our treasure, as the one that we can go to that we know understands what we are experiencing. And we know that he is praying for us exactly what we need. So, that was number one, our reactions to suffering. Now, the text doesn't deal with this, but I thought it would be wrong to go through this and not talk briefly about the purpose of suffering. It's not enough just to say we suffer. I want to encourage you in that suffering. I've got six brief ways that suffering is working towards something. Suffering is doing something. Number one, it provokes our trust in God. We tend... This is not always the case, but we tend to trust God much less when things are going very well in our lives. And we tend to trust him much more when we've been dramatically shown how little control and how little sovereignty we have over our lives. Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Did you catch that? He delivers them out of all of the afflictions that the righteous have. Here's what that doesn't say. It doesn't say when. It doesn't say how. But it promises that he will. So we have promises that we can trust. We have things that we can rely on, that we can lean back on. One of the first, one of the first Bible verses, that, this, is why, this is why I hammer Bible memory so hard. This is why this is such an important part. This is why we make it part of our service. The first verse that I ever learned was Psalm fifty fifteen, And call upon me in your day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Do you know how many times I have held on to that verse and clung to that promise? in the midst of turmoil and trial and difficulty. When I had nothing else to turn to, I could lean on that. And I always had it with me. Psalm 19, or 119, 71 says, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. So your suffering is good because it's teaching you to trust more in God. Number two. Let me back up real quick on that one something provokes our trust in God Um, C.S. Lewis said this if my house had collapsed at one blow that is because it was a house of cards the faith which took these things into account was not faith but imagination in other words when he walked through suffering it showed how little he really trusted God and it provoked him to greater trust in God, okay? Number two, it proves who we belong to. The world hates us because the world hated Christ. 
Look at Matthew 10, 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. For my name's sake. So if you are not united with Christ, if you're not claiming Christ, then why would anybody hate you for his name's sake, right? So this is like belong to him, we're united with him, therefore the world hates us because of him. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now skip a few verses down to verse 25 in Matthew 10. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? Now, Christ said things like count the cost, before you follow me, right? A builder doesn't just build a home and, and he counts the cost. Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to claim Christ? Are you going to have your life united with his by faith? Suffering is a necessary consequence of that because in your suffering, it proves who you really belong to. It proves that you're his. Beloved, if you're claiming Christ and you've never suffered for Christ, I'm not, I'm not talking about like you, you're drug out into the street and whipped or something like that. I'm talking about even people mocking you, making fun of you, slandering you, anything like that. If you've never received reproach because you're claiming Christ, you might not belong to him. You might not belong to him. Because the radically ordinary life of a believer lives with Christ at the center such that you will be persecuted, mocked, scorned, suffer because of him, because it shows who we belong to. 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 4, share in the suffering, or share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So suffering provokes our trust in God. It proves who we belong to. It also provides experience of God's faithfulness. 2 Corinthians 1, 4-5. This is talking about, Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus, who comforts us in all our afflictions. God comforts us in all of our afflictions. Why? so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort that which we ourselves are comforted by God. So there's somebody in your life that is going through struggle, that is going through um, suffering, and because you've gone through suffering and been comforted by God, that makes you uniquely equipped to be able to comfort this brother or sister in Christ that is going through suffering. But what do we often do? We try to comfort them with our own wisdom, with our own insight, with our own spiritual prowess. And we comfort them with the same comfort with which we were comforted, namely the comfort of God. We remind them of the gospel. We point them to Christ. Verse 5, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. So our suffering provides experience of God's faithfulness and allows us to live in community with one another in a way that encourages one another and builds one another up and points one another to Christ. So one of the purposes then of your suffering is so that you can come along and help somebody else that's going through the exact same thing that you're going through with the same comfort that you receive from God. You see how God designed us for community? He designed us to live with one another, to support one another. So your suffering might not even be for you. You might walk through something so that you can turn around and go bless somebody else in the future and comfort them with the comfort with which you were comforted by God. Number four, it proves that God created our faith, 1 Peter 1, 7. So that the tested, Peter says that you grieved with trials of various kinds so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of 
Jesus Christ. And this is where Christ as our moder- mediator is so key. Think of Peter. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 32. Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. Satan wants you. If you're a believer here in this room, Satan wants you. Let me ask you a question. Are you any match for Satan? How do you do standing up against one of the greatest angels that God ever created? Left up to you, you're done. But we have a mediator who is praying for us. Look, this is what Christ says. But I have prayed for you. John 17, Christ prays for believers today that their faith will not fail. If you're a believer here today, Satan wants you. He wants to sift you like wheat. He wants your faith to fail. He wants you, sort of the same attitude as with Job, take everything away, he'll curse you. He wants you. But one who is greater than Satan has prayed for you. Listen to what Christ says. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. So what is the reason that Simon Peter's faith did not fail? What's the reason? It's that Christ prayed for him that it wouldn't fail. Not because he was so awesome in himself. Peter was consistently sticking his foot in his mouth. He ran into the tomb. And in my imagination, the way that I see Peter in the Gospels, as he was running into the tomb, he forgot to duck because that's the type of guy that he is and just rams his head into the top of the tomb. Like Peter just does stupid stuff. Stupid stuff like saying, I'll go to the cross with you. Christ says, you need to learn humility. So I'm going to give you over to Satan a little bit but I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And because I prayed for you, your faith will not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Go through these last two briefly. Silence is God's cosmic accusers. There are demons that are sitting there saying, these people only worship you because you give them good things. Suffering, walking through suffering and glorifying God in the midst of suffering silences all of that. In Revelation, they've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony because there is an accuser that seeks to accuse day and night. And finally, it conforms us to the image of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 17. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to things that are seen but to things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal wow the suffering that we go through is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond everything Lewis again nothing will shake a man or at any rate a man like me, out of his merely verbal thinking and his merely notional beliefs. He has to be knocked silly before he comes to his senses. Only torture will bring out the truth. Only under torture does he discover it himself, he continues. But suppose that what you are up against is a surgeon whose intentions are wholly good. The kinder and more conscientious he is, the more inexorable inexorably, sorry, he will go on cutting. If he yielded to your entreats, if he stopped before the operation was complete, all the pain up to that point would have been useless. And he concludes, I need Christ, not something that resembles him. So as we close, I ask this, how do we respond to suffering? First thing we see in this psalm, Psalm 70, verses 1 through 3, is we see prayer. The psalmist responds to suffering in prayer. Make haste to me, O God. Deliver me. This is not formal. Right? This is not Lord's Prayer type of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. You, you, you read these, these uh, different uh, teachers that'll say you, you got to approach prayer a certain way. Like there, are, there are times when you are in so much turmoil and distress that you do not have time 
And there is no formality about it. It is just, God, help me. I am in the midst of pain and sorrow and suffering. I have nowhere else to turn. You can take care of this. Help me. This lack of formality is coming boldly into the presence of God. Do you come boldly into the presence of God when you go through suffering? Do you walk in there as a child and say, help, I need help, Dad. Tim Keller also said that no one dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a drink of water except for a child. We have that kind of access. So the first thing that we do is we pray, and we pray boldly. Second thing we do is we have a Christian hedonist attitude. Christian hedonist is somebody who says that my greatest joy, my greatest good is God. And therefore, I will pursue that joy, and I will pursue that God above all else. So God's glorified and I'm satisfied. A Christian hedonist seeks to find his greatest joy and pleasure and delight in the only source of the greatest joy and pleasure and delight, namely God. Therefore, everything in his life is aimed at pursuing God above all else. Look at verse 4. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Now keep in mind this guy's still suffering. And he's saying, may everyone who seeks you rejoice in you and be glad in you, even in the midst of the suffering. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Joy in God and his work, not based in circumstance, but based in who he is and what he does. Lewis again. Praise is the mode of love which always has some element of joy in it. Now, if you're walking through suffering and you don't feel like you have anything to rejoice about, do you love your salvation? Because if you love your salvation, if you love the God of salvation, then you know that you're saved and God is great. Therefore, you can rejoice and be glad in Him. Whom have I in heaven but you, and on earth there is none I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. John Piper said this, that no one ever experiences the deeping, deepest and most lasting joy, satisfaction, and fellowship in God on the primrose path of ease. No one ever experiences their deepest, most lasting joy, satisfaction, and fellowship with God on the primrose path of ease. It is always through suffering. And so this psalmist has an eternal hope. He's got an eternal perspective. He's got an eternal joy that's not found in our circumstances. Our salvation reconciles us to God and frees us to say, God is great and we rejoice and are glad in God. And it's in the midst of suffering. C.S. Lewis again said, part of every misery is, so to speak, the misery's shadow or reflection. The fact that you don't merely suffer, but you have to keep on thinking about the fact that you suffer. Yet, when we focus on Christ, when we find our joy in God in the midst of suffering, he says this, thus up from the garden to the gardener, from the sword to the smith, to the life-giving life and beauty that makes beautiful. In other words, you take your focus off of the thing that's created and you focus on the creator. And when you do that, you have joy. It doesn't mean your circumstance changes, but it means you have joy in the midst of suffering. Verse 5, dependence. We should be dependent upon God. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer, O Lord. Do not delay. Someone who is poor and needy is utterly dependent upon God. Psalm 43, 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you at turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Lewis again 
God was not trying an experiment on my faith or love in order to find out their quality. He already knew. It was I who didn't. In this trial, he makes us occupy the dock, the witness box, and the bench all at once. He always knew that my temple was a house of cards. His only way of making me, me realize it was the fact, or realize that fact was to knock it down. Lewis needed to learn to be dependent on God, and we need to learn to live in dependence upon God. Finally, we see that in the same verse at the end. Oh Lord, do not delay. Come quickly. There is a future hope and a future confidence. One day, everything will be made right. One day, there will be no more tears. That's the point of that passage in Revelation. There's no more tears. There's no more sickness. There's no more pain. For the former things have passed away. The new things have come. In the Return of the King, one of my favorite quotes from that book, Samwise Gamgee, after everything was done, he's talking to Gandalf. He says, it's as if everything that was sad has come untrue. Beloved, when you're suffering, when you're in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, it is temporary. And there will come a day when everything that is sad will come untrue. All the wrongs will be righted. There will never be any more sorrow or pain or suffering. And on that day, you will know that what God was doing in that trial was making you more like Christ and teaching you to rely on him more, delight in him more, trust in him more. And it will not be wasted. Not one minute of your suffering will be wasted. Close with Lewis and with Job. It was too perfect to last, so I am tempted to say of our marriage, this book is about losing his wife. Uh, it was too perfect to last, so I am tempted to say of our marriage. But it can be met in two ways. It can be grimly pessimistic, as if God no sooner saw two of his creatures happy, than he stopped it. None of that here. As if he were like a hostess at a sherry party who separates two guests at the moment they show signs of having gotten to a real conversation. But it could also mean this has reached its proper perfection. This has become what it had to, or this has become what it had in it to be. Therefore, of course, it would not be prolonged. As if God said, good. You've mastered that exercise. I'm very pleased with it. And now you are ready to go to the next. Job book of Job does not explain suffering. But Job says this, Though you slay me, yet I will hope in you. Does suffering make you bitter or better? Do you run to Christ or to yourself? Can you say with Job, Though you slay me, I will hope in you. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that as we are tested in the trials and afflictions in our life, that our faith would emerge refined, perfected, more precious than anything else. That you would be shown to be more glorious than anything that we lose, more satisfying than anything else that we place our hope in. That you would be the sole sun around which we orbit that our lives would reflect your goodness and your character and that in the midst of trial, in the midst of suffering, we would run to you like children and that it would make us better, not bitter. That we would share in the sufferings of Christ, that we might be glorified with Christ. And that we might hope in God in the midst for we shall again praise you, our salvation and our God. We ask you to do this for your glory and for our good in Jesus' name.